Welcome to Stellar Cycles, a podcast dedicated to showing each woman her intrinsic power to guide her life, her cycle, her relationships, and her dreams. I cover feminine energy, reproductive health, and all things related to being a potent and magical being that is woman. I'm your host, Alina, and today our topic is manifesting out of your feminine energy. The goal for today is to highlight my friend Rasheen, a master manifester and also the San Diego Book Club founder. We're going to be talking about how she developed her feminine side, became more receptive and intuitive, started book club, and is living her best life. First, I'm going to get into some current updates about me. Since my getting back on track episode, I've really taken that to really motivate myself to throwing myself back into my routine, complete with a whole system that I designed in Notion to help me track my progress. Every day I have little fields that I fill out, like what time I woke up, my sleep score, my readiness score, and just little checklist of things every day that I want to stay on top of. So it shows me my action items for the day, also my meal plan, my morning routine checklist, my evening routine checklist. So that's going to be a really great way to, number one, stay motivated and inspired to tick those little things off every single day, but then also in retrospect to look back and see how far I've come, all the things that I managed to get done. So feeling really, really good about getting organized and also meal planning has been a huge part of that. I really took time this weekend to sit down, think what I'm going to be eating according to my phase that I'm in. I went to the farmer's market, picked up some produce and kind of the whole day just spent prepping it and setting myself up for success this week. Another thing is we're enjoying a really warm, sunny fall in San Diego. I love it, hate it, both. Honestly, I'm so thrilled to be living in a part of the country that has such incredible weather, but I'm at the same time sad that it's not appropriate for those autumn and winter fits that I've been waiting for. So going to be waiting for the colder trips to Spokane, Portland, Canada to really pull out those winter fits. So yeah, I've just been staying really present with my routine, also planning for the next book club, which is going to be more of a Friendsgiving vibe. So very excited to have a potluck moment with everyone, see what everyone's going to bring to share. And overall, October's been a very social month for me. Very, very excited about that. But at the same time, like realizing how much time it takes away from me being able to do what I need to do. So I've been finding a lot of stillness in taking on mundane home tasks like organizing the supplement drawer clearing out old food in the fridge and just setting it up in a way where I can see the things that I want to eat that I purchased so that they won't go bad that's been my updates what I've been working on this fall let's get into the episode today so the guest is my friend Rasheen Zamayar She is an incredible woman, and I've learned so much from her in the short time that I've known her. I met her in my first book club meeting back in March. So without further ado, let me present Rasheen. Hi, Alina. I'm so excited to be on your podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. And I absolutely love having you at book club. Why don't you tell us about where you're from, a little bit about your background, your cultural background. Yeah, so I am Persian, Iranian American, and I grew up in San Diego, but my mom moved over here when she was pregnant with me when she was 18 years old. 18? Mm -hmm. So they left during the Iranian revolution. So it was kind of a stressful time. It still is a stressful time in Iran. And thank God that I was able to be born here in America. And so I feel really blessed to be here. Yes. Yeah, I can totally relate to that being from Ukraine myself and just even now seeing what's going on over there. I couldn't be more both happy and sad at the same time because, you know, you still have loved ones back there dealing with the oppression, the wars, things like that. But what a blessing that we got to be here and be able to help from here, right? Yeah, exactly. So I just wanted to talk because I always like to ask my guests about, first and foremost, the female cycle and how it pertains to them. So how did the women in your family approach the feminine cycle? Was it something secretive? Was it something open? So Iranian culture in general is very, it's very secretive. We don't talk about sex. We don't talk about our bodies. We don't talk about anything. It's almost like shameful 
So I grew up in a very conservative family and didn't know anything about any of that. I had heard stories of this one ritual that when a girl starts her period, it is a ritual for her mom to slap her. And it's not like a mean slap. It's just kind of like a get ready for life. Yeah. <laughs> slap. Wow. Yeah. I've never heard anything like this. <laughs> it's not like she's angry at you. It's kind of like, yeah, bad girl. I guess it's time for you to be a woman kind of an energy. And so I had heard my mom talking to my grandma about that. And I was so afraid because I didn't know what any of it meant. And of course, I couldn't ask. So I'm like, I think something's going to happen where my mom's going to slap me at some point. And I'm so afraid of this. Mm. (laughs) So that's all I knew. Wow. So there's that Persian cultural component. What about since you grew up in the States, right? You grew up in California. Yeah. San Diego always, right? Yes. Yes. So then just knowing that, but then did you also go off and do any of your own research about what's going to happen? What are periods? Things like that. Not really. I mean... I guess in sex ed, they kind of touched upon it. And so I had heard from that, but I didn't do any extra research. Again, I felt a lot of shame around that area. So I didn't ask about it. I even tried not to think about it Mm because it was like not to be thought about even. During sex ed, I remember learning some things and being curious, but not so much that I could actually ask my mom. Mm -hmm. So what about when the time came? How did that go for you? Did you get the slap? Oh, yes. I actually got my period really late. So I think I was 15 and my younger cousin had gotten it. And we were like sisters. So, you know, she told me. And so I was like, oh my God, is something wrong with me? Like she's younger than me a year and I still haven't gotten it. But again, of course I didn't say anything. But yeah, when I was 15, sure enough, it came. And I think I hid it from my mom for a few days. And I looked under the cabinet trying to find something because I knew of pads and then I couldn't find it. And so after about two days, I finally broke down and I was like, mom, this has happened. And she just did like a light tap on that. Oh, <laughs> and she was like, it's okay. okay. Yeah. She was like, oh. it was, it's just more of a tradition. Right. So she helped me out. Okay. It. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. But you were just terrified of like, this <laughs> premonition that it's going to be this horrible thing. Yeah. That's crazy. So then for the rest of your first several cycles, how did you feel? Were you more prepared then? Did you feel lost? How did that go? Yeah, it's been a learning experience. And I think even now I still learn from what my period means, what my hormones mean. Mm -hmm. So it's always a learning experience. I was just so lost Mm -hmm. back in middle school, high school that I didn't even know what I needed to know. Yeah. And something kind of funny to note is that we are aligned with our cycles. So when we're going through something, I'll be like, I'm on my luteal phase. I feel crazy right now. And Rasheen is like, me too. I'm also on my luteal phase. And then we go through the menstrual and then we come out like new butterflies in our follicular phase. Like we can do this. So that's why I, we scheduled the podcast today. Yes. We're in our follicular phase. Yes. Yes. Moving into ovulatory, feeling mm-hmm. more vocal, mm-hmm. feeling more communicative. So, did you go on birth control when you were a teenager? Yeah. So, this is actually a crazy story that I haven't shared with you. When I was 16 years old, 16 or 17, so I had only had my period for a few years at that point. One day, it was around Christmas time, and the whole family was over, and I started having period cramps and it got so bad that I, I went and laid down and the pain got so incredibly unbearable that I started screaming, take me to the hospital. And I was not a, you know, a girl who liked doctors or anything like that. So that was very Mm -hmm. out of character. So my mom took me to the emergency room and after lots of testing and unknowns, they found that I had a cyst on my right ovary and that I had an ovarian torsion. (gasps) No way. There's like not very many stories that I hear about this. Even being in the ultrasound field, there's not many cases of torsion that we see, even though that's what we check for constantly in the Mm -hmm. pelvic studies. Yeah. So I'm one of those textbook patients. So I presented to the hospital, extreme pain. They didn't know what was wrong with me. They needed to check several things like like my appendix, whether it was unplanned pregnancy, all these things. And when they did the ultrasound, actually, they couldn't get any visuals. And it's because my ovary had enlarged so large 
because there was blood going in and it was twisted so it couldn't flow out. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't actually get a visual on the ultrasound, so they had to go in with surgery to take a look at it. Wow. How old were you at this point? 16 or 17. Wow. So very young and while I was still just going through puberty, really, learning about myself and having to go through this was really traumatic. And so, yeah, they went in and once I came out of surgery, they said that it would be best for me to go on birth control to regulate my hormones and all sorts of things. So that's why I started birth control so young. Wow. And that's one or two years after you started Mm -hmm. your cycle and already you had such a big problem. Yeah. Do you have any sort of lump or bulging out because of your ovary was a bit? No? No. Wow. Yeah. I didn't physically see it on the outside. I just knew something was terribly wrong. And every time I mentioned this to a doctor, they kind of stop and they say, wow, that is the most painful thing that somebody can go through. And it really was. They had shot me up filled with morphine and I was still crying from pain. It was so bad. But thank God I survived. (laughs) And it did start me on my journey with birth control. And, you know, fast forward many years, I then decided that I didn't want to be on birth control anymore. So probably like five years ago, Mm -hmm. I stopped birth control. Mm -hmm. Nice. So you were in high school, going to college. How did you decide what field you wanted to go into? I've always loved the sciences, just had a natural aptitude for it. So when I got to college, I decided that I would be a biology major. It was just, it came so easily to me. I just understood it. So I did really well in the biological sciences. And I remember thinking to myself, like, what am I going to do with this degree? So, you know, I thought about just being like a lab tech or working in research and medicine. And I was just kind of going through it in my head. And it's kind of a weird story. At the time, I was working at the Italian restaurant uh, what's the Italian? Is it Bencato or something? Like that? No, no. There's so many Italian restaurants. <laughs> the one here. that's like a chain. Olive Garden. Olive Garden. <laughs> so okay, during college, I was waiting tables at Olive Garden, and it was hurting my wrists because those plates are so heavy. And so I was driving home, and I was going to college, and I was a biology major, and I passed by a lens crafters. There was a big sign that said "Now Hiring," so I'm like, hmm, that should probably be better for my wrist. So I went in and I ended up being the assistant of the optometrist. Mm -hmm. And after some time I thought about it and I'm like, well, I'm doing all the work here. And (laughs) (laughs) so this job seems pretty easy. So maybe I should just be an optometrist. And literally that's how I decided. Wow. Mm -hmm. So what is the application process like for optometry? Do you have to take the MCAT or things like that? Yeah, it's called the OAT. It's just like the dental test, the DAT, I Mm -hmm. believe it is. So yeah, after I graduated with my bachelor's in biology, I started studying for the OAT. Then there's only 16, at the time there was only 16 optometry schools in all of the United States. Mm. So I think they accept like one out of 1,000 applicants. So it's very, very difficult to get into. Actually, this is how my manifestation story started. I had watched The Secret, and because I knew how difficult it was to become an optometrist, I'm like, hmm, maybe I should try this manifestation. So as I was working as the assistant for the optometrist, patients would ask for his card, and as I would hand it to them, I would pretend like I was handing them my card. Mm -hmm. And as I would walk down the hallway, his diploma was on the wall, and I would pretend that it was my diploma on the wall. Mm -hmm. And I kind of just would visualize myself being an optometrist. And actually at the time there was only two optometry schools in California, which were the most difficult to get into Berkeley and Fullerton. And, uh, I was like, man, like, am I going to be able to get into these? Well, something prompted me to keep looking and I really wanted to stay in California. And the exact year that I was applying a brand new school opened up called Western University of Health Sciences College Mm -hmm. of Optometry. And I was like, bet I would have better chances here since the school is so brand new. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I had my application process and 
they accepted me so wow that's awesome mm-hmm. that you just slid right in there yeah <laughs> <laughs> like what are the chances that there had only been two optometry schools mm-hmm. for 50 years mm-hmm. and plus mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden the same year that I'm applying there's a brand new wow. school. So it was, wow. it was really nice. And I got to go to a brand new school, brand new facilities. Everything was high tech. So it was, that's really, awesome. Yeah. I do attest to that power of using your imagination for the best case scenario mm-hmm. outcome rather than worrying like, Oh my God, I'm not going to get in. Oh my God, I'm not good enough. Kind of the same thing for me with ultrasound school. Mm-hmm. There was maybe 14 spots in the program and about 50 or more applicants. And all of them are really good students, yep. right? Mm-hmm. So you're really in competition. But even back then in 2018, I was visualizing myself getting the call, mm-hmm. saying yes to entering the program, visualizing myself going to the classes. And you're really using your brain to help you get to that outcome. Yes, exactly. How long was the optometry school? So optometry school is four years. And yeah, it's, it's a very grueling process, four years of I think it's an equivalent to 30 or 40 units per semester. So you were in class from 7 a.m. to 11 at night. And there's no holidays, no weekends, nothing like that. So it was like the Olympics for your brain, as I like to say. Grind mode, for sure. Fully in my masculine. (laughs) I believe it, you know, because you're out here, you're hustling. You're like, I need to make this career happen for myself. Coming out of optometry school, becoming a practicing doctor, what was your personal approach to healing people in their vision? The biggest reason that I wanted to go into it was to help people. I just naturally am a healer. I just feel it. Anytime someone's sick, anytime someone needs to talk, I was always the one that wanted to be there. So it's just the perfect mix of being able to be that for your patients and being able to support the community and at the same time fix their vision. Mm -hmm. So what's the most common problem that people come in with? I would say myopia. So myopia is nearsightedness. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what I have. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't see far. No, I got glasses at age of 10. Oh, I didn't know this. Yes, I have to tell you this story because I was an avid reader throughout my childhood. Um, We we did have a TV, but it only had the church channels on it and stuff. No Disney channel, no Nickelodeon, none of that. So what did we have to entertain ourselves with was books. So both me and my brother got really bad vision because we would sit and read until it was dark and straining our Mm -hmm. eyes and stuff. Youngest brother never got affected with that. But my dad also had vision problems. He had to get LASIK twice. But I remember telling my mom, take me to the doctor. I can't see. Everything is blurry. And she's like resisting it, resisting it. And then finally took Mm -hmm. me in. And the doctor was giving me those little Uh slides, right? And I was just like nope, can't see that, can't see that. And she's like, okay, I'm going to have to prescribe you glasses. My mom's like, you're lying. You're not. And I was crying in that office because... Why did you think you were lying? I don't know. I think she didn't want to believe that there was something wrong with me, you know? And I remember getting my glasses and I thought I looked so good in those glasses. (laughs) I loved it. I showed up to church with my glasses on and my friends made fun of me. That's like part of the Slavic culture. It's like, oh, if you have a disability, you know, like that's how they see it. But I loved my glasses. I loved how clearly I could I see I love that. Them. I love that you're like, I don't care what you guys have to say, but I look great. Even back then, trust That's me. Awesome. Like, yeah. So, so there's that. And then at 12, I got on contacts. Mm. And so then you've been doing contacts for a long time. For a long time and from 12 to 24. So 24 is when I got LASIK and it freaking changed my life. Yeah, LASIK is amazing. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of people that are scared to get it because they hear of the horror stories or something like the laser going wrong or something. You and... know, LASIK has been going on now for 30 years. Mm-hmm. I think we're at that place in history now where we know that it's very safe. Mm-hmm. It has a 99.99 happiness rating. I mean, yeah, of course it can be scary because you're laying there with your eyes open under a laser, but Mm -hmm. it's quick and they really do a good job for checking to make sure you don't have the problems that could be a problem down the line. Mm -hmm. So those horror stories that you might've heard of were things that happened back in the day when Mm -hmm. they didn't have the proper tools to measure the thickness of the cornea Mm -hmm. to see if it was going to hold like, cause they have to take some of that tissue off. Mm -hmm. So that's when 
things go wrong. Yeah. I flew to Portland actually, get my LASIK from Dr. Brian Will, who has been practicing for like 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. He was the one who did my dad's LASIK. So when we were still in Ukraine, my dad actually flew to the United States in 1998 or something or 2001 to get LASIK done specifically by this guy. And I went to the same guy and they were truly like family friends. I felt so taken care of. It was truly the easiest procedure I have ever done in my life easier than going and getting a cavity filled you yeah know? oh so, yeah oh good I'm glad you had a good yeah. experience most people do I actually worked in a LASIK center during my clinical rotations and so I was the doctor who checked the post-op so patients would come in the next day mm-hmm. after their LASIK and I would see if everything was okay and oh my god I loved those patients because mm. they'd be like crying like I can see this morning was the first time in my life I woke up and I didn't need my glasses so it it is a beautiful thing that we've reached a place in history where we can provide that to people Mm -hmm. so what does your daily work consist of now I've cut down on my practicing so I only practice two days a week and I go into the office and I see anywhere from 10 to 30 patients depending on the day 30 yeah. That's crazy. I know. Is it's it like crazy. a five minute appointment? Yes. Okay. It, when you're getting to 30 patients, it's a hi, hello, one better, two better. Are you going blind? No, great. Bye. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> <laughs> luckily I've been practicing for a while and I have spidey sense, six sense. So I can pick up on most people are healthy. They just need a new prescription for glasses, new prescription for contacts. But then, you know, there are those fishy ones where they come in and you're like, maybe I need to do some more testing Mm -hmm. and thank God I'm so connected to my intuition because I've ended up finding some things that have prevented them from Mm -hmm. losing their vision, things like glaucoma or retinal detachment. Yeah. What do you kind of hope to accomplish in the future with optometry and with other things for your career? Yeah, I think I do see optometry in my life long term, but in small doses. Clinical practice is pretty grueling. Seeing 30 patients, I'm there 10 hours. I get really tired by the end of the day. I feel like a shell of a human almost because it's just you give and you give. But I do enjoy the practice and helping the patients. So I actually see myself doing it well into my 80s, Mm -hmm. like leaving my house, going to hang out with my patients Mm -hmm. for like a day Mm -hmm. (laughs) or maybe part time. Like four hours, two days a week or something like that. So that's kind of what I see. I definitely would not do it full time. Mm -hmm. It just drains every ounce of femininity in my body Mm -hmm. and just puts me into my masculine energy. And I don't feel at my optimal or at my healthiest version Mm -hmm. when I'm in the office for that many hours a day. Yeah, I feel like in any healing modality, whether you work in the hospital, whether you work in an outpatient clinic, optometry, dentistry, it does take so much healing energy that you really have to remember to fill up your own cup, right? Mm -hmm. So you can come back and show up and be very present with your patients and things like that. Let's head into your journey with manifestation. I know you touched on it a little bit, but I just want to ask, how did your family react to it or people around you? Yeah, I think A lot of people around me have started to label me woo-woo. My family is pretty open-minded. They've watched The Secret with me, and they believe in it as well. I'm just very passionate about it, Mm -hmm. and I want to learn all about it, and I implement it in my life every single day. So I'm constantly reminding them of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they might feel maybe a little annoyed by me sometimes. (laughs) But other than that, it's been a great journey Because I think when you talk about it with somebody, you'll see a little light go off in their eye that's like, oh yeah, I kind of do remember that I have this power. I like that you use the word remember because I feel like a lot of the things in life, we're not actually learning them, we're remembering them Mm -hmm. because they're all innate within us and just the way that society is and conditioning, we tend to forget that we have these intrinsic powers. Mm -hmm. So remembering is a really good word. Yep. For those listeners who don't know what The Secret is, can you describe it real quick? So The Secret came out, I think in like the 90s or early 2000s. How I was introduced to it was literally on a CD. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was a DVD. 
And, you know, a lot of people, when you talk about The Secret, they're like, oh, I read the book, but I've never read the book. I, it's a documentary that I watched. Did you watch the documentary? Did you no, read the book? I listened to the audiobook. So I love the documentary. I'm pretty sure that's how it originally came out, and then they put it into a book. So it's just a bunch of people who knew about The Secret, had studied The Secret, and they were interviewed. And they just talk about what they knew about this secret. And the secret is manifestation, the law of attraction. And so it was really the first time I think in human history that something like this Mm -hmm. went mainstream Mm -hmm. and it had a profound effect on my life Mm -hmm. because as a child and growing up in my family, I would say they are kind of negative or, you know, I mean, they escaped war, yes, <laughs> lived in poverty. So I can see why they had those patterns. But as I was growing up, they instilled that kind of mindset in me. So I found myself to worry a lot, have background anxiety, depression, and overthink a lot. And so when I was introduced to the secret, it really shifted my energy and how I viewed the world. Mm, Yes, I agree with you. I think a lot of immigrants, especially ones who escape such horrific circumstances, it's really hard to just switch to a different belief system, Mm -hmm. you know? So even though you're in a new land with more opportunities, you're still kind of always watching your back, right? Mm -hmm. So you did give us your example of how you used the secret for getting into optometry school, but what other ways did you implement it into your life? It's been a slow process that happened with optometry school. And I was like, wow, I think that I manifested this. And then you kind of forget again, and then you go into a rut and then something would happen and somehow I would remember it again. So yeah, as time has progressed, I find myself manifesting more and more and I do it for the littlest thing, you know, maybe a cup of coffee. If I focus on having that, somebody will bring me a cup of coffee and all the way up to, I manifested the apartment that I currently live in in three months. So, and it wasn't like I was really trying. I visualized it maybe two times or three times and now I'm living in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how you manifested that guitar player for the La Jolla book club meeting. Oh my God, it was so crazy. So what happens is when you're constantly working on your vibration, you raise your vibration and then you naturally just have an idea and then it just simply manifests. Like you don't really try anymore. Mm -hmm. And we were having a book club themed Italian summer nights and I got this kind of idea or I don't know if you brought it up or it just came up and we were like, how cool would it be if we had either a violinist or a guitarist? And I was like, yeah, that would be cool. But the price point was too high. And so anyways, I go to work the day before the actual event and I'm talking to one of my patients and he's telling me about his glasses that he needs and how he has a very specific length where he needs his glasses to be at. And I'm just really focusing on the numbers, doing the calculation. And he had mentioned I'm a Spanish guitarist master. Mm -hmm. And again, I was focusing on the optometry aspect. I didn't really catch it (laughs) quite yet. And I'm just right. And then it was like time slowed down and I was like, no, 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 no. And I'm like, wait, what did you say you are? And he's like, yeah, I'm a Spanish guitarist. I'm like, I'm looking for a Spanish guitarist for my event tomorrow. Would you be able to come to my event? And he was like, sure. Mm-hmm. And ended up coming. He's amazing. Such was, a sweet guy. It was incredible. Honestly, like he added so much to the vibe, just, you know, plucking away on his little guitar. It was literally perfect. But yeah, that's that's literally an example for you guys of manifestation of things just dropping into your reality when you're just kind of like focusing and you weren't just like focusing on it all day. You just kind of like released it to the universe mm-hmm. and then the universe delivered. Just delivered it. Yep. Like an Amazon Prime. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So were there any hurdles that you had to overcome, like your personal beliefs that were already rooted in you, like anxiety, other experiences maybe that didn't go well that you, you know, really had to overcome in order to fully dive into this new way of living. 
Yeah, of course. You always have negative beliefs that almost try to like sabotage you, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So especially the patterning of what you grew up with, like say the belief, I have to work hard for my money. A lot of us have that. That's deep in there. A lot of people feel like you need to work hard for your money. So how do you deprogram that? I think it's just a lot of self-work a lot of awareness. So every single day when I wake up, I first meditate and then I journal. So when I journal, I'm very aware of what my limiting beliefs are, what keeps coming up for me. And so I go through and do like a mini therapy session Mm -hmm. for myself. So it's like two sides of me. The side is complaining about something Mm -hmm. and the side is like, oh, well, what's the belief behind it? Mm -hmm. Is this true? So Mm -hmm. I'm constantly doing this work within myself And yeah, other things like breath work and I've done everything I feel like to try to delete those limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if I'm hearing you correctly, manifestation, it's not all just rainbows and butterflies. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of having to work on also the inner resistance that your ego is, you know, it's always trying to keep you comfortable, Mm -hmm. right? So that you don't grow out of your comfort zone. But manifestation, a lot of it has to do with breaking down those beliefs and that resistance within you. Cause I feel that way too. Sometimes on one hand, I'm visualizing and believing like, yes, I can do this. But on the other hand, the inside part of me is like, no, you can't have that. Mm -hmm. Who do you think you are? You know? And it's like a lot of it has to do with breaking that part down and truly looking within and looking at what's blocking me from doing this. Cause manifesting is really how we were meant to live, right? God instills in all of us a creative power to create our life. And if we're made in his image, who is a creator, then why wouldn't we have the power to create our lives and guide them, you know? So let's lead into feminine energy because I think you're truly not just a master manifester, but you are such a beacon of feminine energy to all of us around you. So when did you realize you were not operating in ideal feminine energy? I think it goes back to when I was working full time as an optometrist and I was managing the store and I was really desiring a partner and there was a lot of blocks around that. I wasn't really calling in the right type of men. They were just super out of alignment and it actually happened by accident because of the pandemic. So when the pandemic happened, the practice that I was working at closed down. So I lost my job. I got laid off Mm -hmm. and I had been working for a while. So I had savings and I was like, you know, I'm going to take this as a break. And I'm, it was a little sad, but I just kind of rolled with it. Well, as soon as I lost my job, all of a sudden within a few days, I had all these men being magnetized to me (laughs) and I, Oh, a woman that needs to be taken care of. Right. (laughs) You know, so before I would go in on these dates and be like, I'm an optometrist and and I was probably coming off from work and I had been making all these decisions. And so I was really operating in my masculine and it was really acting as a repellent for the masculine. And I didn't Mm. understand because I, I, I'm like, why do, why don't boys like me? Like, and I just couldn't understand why. And all of a sudden I lose my job and guys are just flocking to me. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, <laughs> what's so funny I, is going I on? I have something to say about yeah. that too. Cause when I was really in my masculine yeah. energy, I would go on dates, like bragging about uh-huh. how good I am at studying, how I'm going to have this crazy <laughs> ultrasound career. I thought that my independence was going to impress them, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. but it really kind of doesn't. Cause then it's like, Oh, what am I here for then? You know, yeah. we just don't know. And I didn't know that it's not that they don't like it. It's just, I don't know how the masculine really works, but they're just, it's an energy and they're drawn to a soft energy and a light energy. And they don't want to hear about every accomplishment. Maybe they feel outshined. I don't know exactly, Mm -hmm. but it was kind of on accident. And I'm like, there's something here because I had enough self-awareness where I'm like, what is it about me losing my job that's creating this magnetization of the masculine energy Mm -hmm. and I started to really think on it and meditate on it and consume more content around that and read more books around it and all of a sudden the light was shed on it Mm -hmm. it's like oh okay so this is a thing yeah. So I just, I got super into it mm-hmm. and now you don't have to lose your job or not work at all <laughs> to get a boyfriend or whatever, but, um, it helps. 
<laughs> it was what showed me, uh-huh. you know? So now yeah. I have a job. I, I do lots of masculine things, but I was still able to call in mm-hmm. my masculine. Mm-hmm. So what resources would you say helped you to increase your femininity? I followed a lot of femininity coaches mm-hmm. on Instagram mm-hmm. and would just kind of watch their content. Mm-hmm. And then on YouTube as well, mm-hmm. one that comes to mind, her name is Mina Irfan. Mm-hmm. She's really good. And Alison Armstrong. Absolutely love her. She wrote the book, The Queen's Code, mm-hmm. and that helped me a lot as well. Mm-hmm. She is a woman who studied men for, I think, 30 years. She's a clinical psychologist. and Be out after, like, one. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, it's a lifetime journey of yeah. this is the opposite sex that we have to live with and do everything in life with. So that's awesome. We'll have to put that book, Queen's Code, into recommendations Code, yeah. for our listeners. Mm-hmm. What did you end up changing about your life? So getting laid off was obviously a big one. But what other things did you change about your life to help you become more feminine? So when I was in my masculine, I was operating from my logic in my brain. So it was like, okay, I need to wake up. I need to set my alarm. I need to make these decisions. And so now I didn't have those things to do. Mm. So I kind of, and I guess this came out of my intuition. I started playing a game with myself since I had nothing to do during my day. I would kind of let my gut lead me. So I would say, okay, so what are we going to do today? And I would randomly just grab a bathing suit and go in my car and go to the beach. I started to learn to tap into that kind of silent intuition inside Mm -hmm. of me and flow. It's kind of hard to describe, but you don't make plans. You kind of just flow. You kind of let the wind blow you. If a friend calls you and says, let's go grab lunch, you say, okay. And you, you have all this space in your day. And it can be quite uncomfortable because you're having to really sit with yourself and not have these to-dos and not be distracted and really just be in tune and say, okay, like... I'm, I'm just going to be sit with a space really. Yeah. And I find that a lot of women who are in their masculine have a difficult time with this. What are we doing next? Okay. Yeah. What, what's going to happen? What's the yeah. plan? Uh, who's going to be there? Yeah. It's, it's all so too much logic mm-hmm. and it takes a level of surrender and trust. Like it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing that's the most uncomfortable. I think when you're starting out to change anything about your life is you have to be painfully present, right? And that's so hard for most of us. Even with, you know, Jessa, the period and menstrual wellness coach that I interviewed a few um, episodes ago, I was like, what's the starting point for people who want to heal their cycles? And she's like, you have to slow down. You have to be present because mm-hmm. that's the root of femininity is just that flow state, you know? Yeah. 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 You just sit and you be with yourself. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you go in nature and you just watch the leaves and watch the clouds and get off your phone and, you know, spend time with yourself. And yeah, mm-hmm. that stillness is where the magic starts mm-hmm. to emerge the femininity starts to emerge in that stillness yeah so how about now how do you continue to nurture your femininity now and keep that masculinity at bay I'd say boundaries so I have a lot of boundaries with work Uh, of course they always want me to come in more and I feel bad and I know they need the help but no I have the boundaries I only work these days and then on my other days that I'm off I flow Mm -hmm. And I I just sit in the stillness. Mm -hmm. And it sounds kind of odd, but that's just where I feel the most comfortable, where I feel the most happiest, most fulfilled, most healthy. And I have that be my practice. How has that helped your anxiety instead of make you more anxious, like not knowing what you're going to do next? Yeah, I mean, I used to have trouble with anxiety and I just don't anymore. Mm -hmm. That level of surrender where you just trust and trust that wherever you're guided to trust that there's something there watching you, God, the universe, when you have that level of trust, then it's easier to not have anxiety because you know that a, if something bad happens, you'll be able to handle it. Mm -hmm. And 
be there's a learning lesson Mm -hmm. in in that yeah and i know this sounds so cliche but truly everything does happen for a Mm -hmm. reason you can't escape those things you can worry about it all you want but it's still going to happen to you because it's part of your journey and you just have to take a lesson that comes out of it yeah and and honestly even if you try to control or resist if it's meant to happen it's going to happen and it's better to just let it happen Mm -hmm. and then ask yourself well what's the lesson here you know what can I change in the future? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So let's talk about book club because that's where we are connected currently. Mm-hmm. And I just want to get into the history of book club a little bit. Like how did the idea come to you? What were the early days of book club like? Yeah. So when I got laid off, I had all this space and time. And so what did I do? Well, I started going out and partying a lot mm-hmm. <laughs> and Uh, everyone through COVID. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I think everyone can relate. Yeah. So I was out a lot. I was socializing a lot. And I noticed that I felt really bored with conversation. It almost felt like nobody had really anything deep to talk about. They just wanted to talk about other people or celebrities or, or something to complain about. Mm -hmm. And I loved going out and socializing and dancing and listening to music and stuff. But that aspect of the conversation was really getting to me. And I I think I just was like, what is there? And there should be something more is Mm -hmm. kind of like the thought that was there. And (laughs) book club is, is actually really crazy because I literally woke up one morning And it was like the strongest, loudest urge. And it said, I'm going to start a book club. Mm -hmm. And I literally took out my phone on my notes page and I just started typing book club, rules of book club. And I filled up a whole page of like, it just flowed out of me. Mm -hmm. And I was meeting with my girlfriend, Gabriella that night for dinner and a few other girlfriends and I was almost kind of nervous to bring it up. I don't know why, but well, I know why. So I've always been pretty shy and book nerd, studious. I don't like to speak in front of people. Mm -hmm. I hate public speaking. I'm now it's different, but back Mm -hmm. then I really hated it. And I didn't really put myself out there. So I went to dinner with my girlfriends and I kind of mentioned it shyly and Gabby and a few other girlfriends were like, oh my God, we'll join your book club. We totally want to read books. And I was like, really? You would read books with me and like hang out? And they're like, yeah. Yeah. So the early days, it actually spread really fast. Mm -hmm. And it pretty much consisted of meeting in my living room apartment. And I would just bring a bottle of wine and we would pick a book and we would all hang out and talk about the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And then how did you end up growing it to what it is now? I mean, we just had our biggest meeting ever. I think Mm -hmm. it was something like 70 people came, Mm -hmm. which, you know, everyone is still talking about that book club, but what was your method for growing it, getting the word out? Honestly, my feminine energy. Mm -hmm. I didn't really try. Mm -hmm. I just enjoyed it. It's my passion. I love to read. I love the idea of community and bringing people together and discussing ideas and having deep discussions and different topics to discuss. Mm -hmm. I just enjoyed it. And Mm -hmm. I think because my passion for it was so high, it radiated Mm -hmm. and I didn't even have a social media until last year. I had lots of people every month come. It was just word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a huge testament to when you just let joy and passion lead whatever you're doing, it's just going to naturally magnetize Mm -hmm. the right people into that group. Yep, exactly. So how's it going currently? I love it. It's growing. There's definitely next steps. I'm implementing all the things that I've learned about surrendering and trusting and just trusting the process, not getting too ahead of myself and just letting it flow. I'm excited for it to grow. If it continues to grow, if it doesn't grow, that's fine too. I'm just happy to serve the community and have a great group of people. I mean, we have amazing people in our book club. I met you through book club. Just the people that show up, I don't even know where they come from. (laughs) They come in and I'm like, where did you come from? You're like an 
angel, like just yeah. like Alina. They're just also looking for a group of people that they can have these deeper intellectual conversations mm-hmm. with. And I'm, I'm just so glad because San Diego is a party town mm-hmm. for sure. I also really struggled in my first two years here because the bar scene isn't mm-hmm. really my thing. I always felt so out of sorts going to any of those events. The book club has truly become a home for me. Mm-hmm. And I've also met so many amazing people through you. Mm-hmm. So very, very lucky to be working with you on it now. And I think it's just only going to get better and better yeah. for sure. I know I love having you be a part of it. I love bouncing ideas off with you and really that vibe attracts your tribe (laughs) saying is so true. Mm -hmm. It just attracts the people that you want to hang out with. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about your relationship because you are in such a, at least what it looks like from the outside, like such a great relationship that you seem so happy in and obviously I didn't know you before when I first came to the book club Rob was there with you already you know so we're gonna get into it I just want to ask you first why did your past relationships not really work out for you what was the common denominator that you kept seeing yeah I would say definitely my past relationships were nothing like the relationship that I have with Rob they just they just weren't right it just never felt right it never was right it never worked out a lot of heartache, a lot of whether it me not seeing it be a fit or them not seeing it be a fit. When my younger years, a lot of it translating into my worth and feeling like there must be something wrong with me. And, you know, once I figured that out and realized that's not the case, you know, things changed a lot. But yeah, it was just a lot of what Alice and Armstrong would say is missing frogs or whatever. <laughs> Something I want to touch on is that when you're in those wrong relationships, they really do hurt. It's a lot of pain. And I think it's your body and your soul and your spirit trying to tell you this is not for you. But we fight. We try to keep it going. We're like, why isn't this working? Stay with me, right? Instead of just gracefully letting it go and be what it is. Do you want to tell the listeners about how you manifested Rob? Yeah. So I was really desiring my masculine counterpart, my soulmate. Just somebody that felt like right to me. And I felt a little lost. I took a year to just be single and just be with myself. And in the meantime, I had been really visualizing and journaling on it. Every new moon, I would do a new moon ritual and I would sit, you know, light a candle, sit with my journal and just write exactly what I wanted. Mm-hmm. So just everything that I wanted. As detailed as possible. As detailed as possible, how I wanted to feel, what I wanted it to look like, this, just all, all the things. And sometimes it would be pages and pages. <laughs> and I ended up going to Burning Man last September with my girlfriend, Gabby. And in that space, I really, I had a lot of, I'd say, downloads or realizations about what I wanted. One thing about people who go to Burning Man, they know, they say the playa provides. So the playa is the land. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy when you're out there because you'll think, oh man, I'm thirsty. And somebody will just hand you a bottle of water. So if you don't believe in manifestation, you go to Burning Man and you're, and this is why people are so obsessed with it, Mm -hmm. is the playa actually provides. And I got really rooted with what I wanted there. And came out of it just knowing what I wanted. And just three months after that, I met Rob. And the day before I met Rob, I had journaled, thank you, God, for now that I have found my soulmate. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you just had this feeling, and I think this is a big secret to manifestation too, is just knowing that it's on its way, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Releasing the how, why, where, when, and just like truly trusting that literally like winning the lottery, you know, there's going to be a little bit of time between winning it, knowing that you won, but then also until that check actually hits your account, right? But Mm -hmm. you still know that it's on the way and you have that trusting energy yeah you just know that it's on the way you know that it's already here actually Mm -hmm. if you becoming supernatural by dr joe dispenza he talks about the quantum field and how all possibilities exist and so there's a version out there that already has what you want and you just bring that vibration to you Mm -hmm. and so at that point i had been single for a year i don't think I had even been with a man for a year, but I could feel his presence with me. 
And it's so crazy because now when, you know, I'm with Rob, I'm like, oh my God, I felt you before you were even here. Mm -hmm. Like I felt it. And you have to get to that place vibrationally before you can manifest it in the 3D. Yeah. So what was the actual meeting him like? And then the early stages of dating for you guys? Well, of course, you know, you have that voice in your head that wants to sabotage it or overthink it or try to like talk you out of it. Talk you out of it. Yeah, exactly. And again, I was just very unattached and I met him in a jacuzzi. (laughs) (laughs) Which is so funny because you guys love to be in the hot tub. We love come and hang out with you. Yeah. Yeah. So he was there with some friends. I showed up with some friends. And at that point I was single for a year and I was really, so one thing that we haven't really touched on is these strong boundaries that those bad relationships that happened taught me. So I have really strong boundaries and nose with men mm-hmm. and you had to be kind of on a certain level for me to even think about going on a date. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he came up to me and tried to talk to me and I literally just walked away from him. (laughs) (laughs) And I loved being single. I love, even though I was actively manifesting Mm -hmm. my partner, I really enjoyed my life and my friends and I was there with my friends. So I I didn't want to not hang out with them just because this guy is trying to talk to me. So yeah. So what really caught my attention was even though I just walked away from him, he just walked right back up Mm -hmm. and didn't lose confidence in a way. And just kind of, he applied that pressure girl. Yeah. He just, yeah, he just held his masculine. He didn't get all bent out of shape because I just dissed him. He he just came up and asked me another question. And Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, that was kind of (laughs) cute. And so we started talking. He quickly grew on me and he asked me on a date for the next night. And Mm -hmm. we had this is what totally won me over. We're like sitting at a sushi dinner and he goes, my friends say that I got a horseshoe up my ass because I'm so lucky. And I'm like, really? So you have the belief that you're just a lucky guy. And he's like, I'm the luckiest guy on earth. (laughs) And I'm like, this is the mindset I want in a partner. Mm -hmm. And he just starts talking to me about manifestation and all these things. And I'm like, Oh, what books have you read? And he's like, no, I haven't read any books. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, no, I just, I'm, I just do this. You're like, you should join my book club. (laughs) So I tell him, I'm like, oh, I have a book club. And he looks me square in the eye and says, I can't read. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, oh, when I try to read, I have too many thoughts in my head. And so now he only listens to Audible. I'm like, oh, you know, you can listen to Audible. And so now he's a part of book club, obviously, and comes to every meeting and loves it. Mm -hmm. And he listens to all the books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something I've observed about the two of you is he really does not like or want you being stressed out. He is actively looking for ways to improve your life, make you feel more safe, make life easier for you. And that's truly what a man in his masculine is meant to do for a woman because it's tough for us out here in this world. It's not a safe world for us. Women are constantly, you know, in danger. So to find a man who's innately a protector is very, very valuable. So how about your life now? You're my neighbor. I love it. I know. What do you love about your life now? Oh my God, everything. (laughs) It's just everything that I've always wanted, everything that I've always dreamed of. Yeah, exactly what you said. He's very much in his masculine. He makes me feel safe. Yeah, he does not want me to be uncomfortable in any way. And if I am, he solves that problem Mm -hmm. for me. And it just helps me really rest even deeper into my feminine. And there are times where you know, I'll snap and like want to go into my masculine and I have to remind myself to just Mm -hmm. let him take the lead and empower him in his masculine. Mm -hmm. So I think what women do is they start to take the lead and it disempowers the masculine. Mm -hmm. So the same man can be disempowered and become not in his masculine Mm -hmm. based on your own energy. Mm -hmm. So because I'm able to constantly lean back and settle into my feminine, it allows him to rise up into his Mm -hmm. masculine and be Mm -hmm. the leader, the provider, the protector Mm -hmm. that my soul truly craves. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much for sharing about that. We're going to wrap this up. And I just wanted to ask you, what do you wish you could tell your younger self having this life now that you have? Uh, I just got goosebumps. Oh my God, so much. I wish I could just like download my brain and give it to my younger <laughs> yeah, self. Yeah, yeah. But it took all the trials and tribulations of my younger self to get here. Mm -hmm. So I think the number one thing would be just chill out. Everything's going to work. Mm -hmm. Everything's going to be Absolutely. fine. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And do you have any tips for our listeners on tapping into their feminine well and calling forth the life that they desire? Just let that be an intention of yours. If you're a woman and you have this idea of masculine femininity come up, work on it and sit with yourself and journal and meditate and go for nature walks and try to just not plan and move your body and put on music and mm -hmm. there's so many different techniques and they might feel like a waste of time or like they're that they're not doing anything but just remember that's your masculine brain coming in mm -hmm. but life on this side is just so sweet and it's totally worth it mm -hmm. And then any guidance for the listeners on how to get into or how to lead the relationship that they truly deserve and desire? I think the biggest thing is to just know what you want. Most people can't manifest because they don't know what they want. So really right. get clear. What is it that you want? And don't be swayed by outside influences, what you see on Instagram. So again, it takes a little bit of stillness to learn, okay, what is it that I truly need? What are my values? What are my desires? And really get clear on that and then have a boundaries list of anything that's not that mm. is a no. Mm. It's not a maybe, it's a no. Mm -hmm. So having so, that, you're telling the universe, okay, if I say no to this guy who's giving me low effort, say he's asking me out on a day, day of, mm. and if you're accepting that, then you're just telling the universe that, you're okay with that. You'll take anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you have to have these strong boundaries. Sometimes you're like, oh, but I'm lonely and I want to go out. No, but what is it that you truly want? And what you truly want is to be loved and chosen and protected, mm -hmm. you know, not just a date. Absolutely. One of my favorite quotes that the hood healer on Instagram is freaking awesome. Awesome. Awesome lady. She says often the universe will send you a decoy before your mm -hmm. desire just to test you. Do you actually want the thing that you're asking mm -hmm. for? Or will you just take anything right now? Yeah. Or, you know? Yeah. You just got to be strong. You have to say no. You have to know exactly what you want and say mm -hmm. no to the thing that's not. And you will absolutely be gifted and mm -hmm. you'll see that there's something at the end of that. Mm -hmm. And finally, any tips for bringing a community together? So for example, like if someone wants to start a book club, how do they start? You just start it. <laughs> you just start it. <laughs> Everything in life, you just do, just do yeah. the thing. So yeah, if you're interested in starting a book club, get some friends together and Pick a date, pick a book, and, and just do it. And stay consistent with it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be every week. It doesn't have to be reading the book together in the club. It could be like people are reading on their own. And like we do once a month, we get together, we have a party, and people mm -hmm. discuss the book. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be anything super overwhelming or daunting. Just truly do it out of the joy of your heart mm -hmm. and wanting to bring people together. And I think that'll be it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is so fun to hang out and talking with yeah, you. Yeah, thank you so much for everything from your background, the slap story. <laughs> I like that's still like my favorite part probably. But and also, you know, shedding some light on how your life has gone, the hurdles that you've had to overcome and just the beautiful, amazing, fulfilled life that you're living now. I'm hoping that our listeners can take something from this episode and start applying it to their lives. And hopefully we'll get some feedback. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Stellar Cycles Pod. And you can follow Rasheen. Her Instagram will also be linked in this episode. You can follow San Diego Book Club for ideas for books or see how our meetings go. It's a really, really fun page. And don't forget to download the free grocery guide that I have for you in the link in the Stellar Cycles Instagram. You can go ahead and get a free PDF. It's just based on every single phase of your cycle, a little grocery list for what you should be eating to support your hormones during each phase that you're going through. And if you're feeling generous, please leave a five-star review and a rating. That would really help the show grow. Till next time, Stellar Cycles out.